on the streets of Washington, D.C. A bomb blast kills a former ambassador and his young assistant. As the FBI investigation closes in on the bombers, the killers set their sights on the agents and their families. The FBI is caught up in a dangerous hunt for a cold-blooded murderer as they target one of the most highly skilled opponents they have ever faced, a bomber who orchestrates the death of a diplomat. In the 1970s, South America faced a surge of political kidnappings and assassinations. When the killing spilled onto U.S. soil, it was time for the FBI to step in. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents struggled to pierce the closely guarded world of diplomats and assassins, trained spies and hired thugs, determined to stop a covert terror war waged by a rogue nation. Washington, D.C., September 18th, 1976. A man prepares deadly revenge against one of his nation's fiercest critics. Dear friends of Chile. The intended victim is former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier. The, the outspoken socialist is in the U.S. condemning the military government of dictator Augusto Pinochet. The Pinochet government seized power three years earlier in a bloody coup. Letelier rails against the current Chilean regime for human rights violations and for stripping him of his Chilean citizenship. His outspoken criticism causes one European country to stop lending money to Chile. Just after midnight on September 19th, the bomber prepares to silence the diplomat once and for all. The radio-controlled bomb is secured under the driver's seat of Letelier's car. Now, all it needs is the right radio signal. Two days later, Letelier drives to work. His assistant, 25-year-old Ronnie Moffat, rides in the passenger seat. Her husband, Mike, rides in back. The car soon arrives on Embassy Row. It's an economic one. But... Police protecting the embassies call for ambulances and rush to help. Orlando Letelier is barely alive. The bomb blew off his legs and blasted shrapnel through his torso. Ronnie Moffat, hit by flying shrapnel, fights for every breath. Mike Moffat, incredibly, escapes unhurt, although frantically worried about his wife. An ambulance rushes Letelier away just as the FBI arrives. Special Agent Carter Cornick. When we got there, like all crime scenes, it was an absolute mess. I saw the car, and there was a woman on the side of the road being administered to. The next thing I actually heard through the din of all the noise was a young man screaming, Dina did it. And I had no idea who or what Dina was. Under the law, the FBI investigates all attacks against foreign officials. Agent Cornick takes charge of the case. Well, the first thing that was to do was, was to get hold, get control of the crime scene. A crime scene is a unique thing. It's only there once. And what you do at that crime scene very often determines, ultimately, the outcome of the case. 
Agent Kornick requests more agents, including FBI bomb experts, to collect and label every possible piece of evidence. We had an enormous amount of help. We had more than 150 agents doing the crime scene. We actually had forensic experts doing the crime scene. And that part of the crime scene was actually run by the chief of the explosive unit at my request. During the search, the FBI hears the tragic news from the hospital that Orlando Letelier and Ronnie Moffitt have died. The case is now a murder investigation. At the U.S. District Courthouse, the U.S. attorney decides this politically sensitive public assassination must be handled with the utmost care and urgency. In this case, a U.S. attorney was assigned to the investigation from day one. That had never been done before except in Watergate. The U.S. attorney assigns his most relentless prosecutor, U.S. Assistant Attorney Gene Proper. It was a heinous murder, and I wanted to solve it to make sure that people knew you couldn't do it here. I don't care if Letelier was a socialist, a communist, or, or somebody on the far right. He was killed in a brutal way on the streets of the District of Columbia with a young woman, neither of whom deserved to die. By the second day, investigators begin looking at possible motives for killing Letelier. The primary motive from the beginning appeared to be a political assassination ordered by a foreign government. We had found out from the State Department that the military dictatorship of Chile was concerned that he had been personally responsible for stopping loans coming to the country. Buenos Aires, Argentina. FBI Special Agent Bob Shearer does not want to tip off the Chilean government, so he talks with his contacts in Buenos Aires. He wants to find out if they have any information on whether Chilean intelligence may be involved. His Argentine source tells him about a secret program called Operation Condor. Intelligence agencies from right-wing South American countries have agreed to help each other watch left-wing activists and, if necessary, eliminate them. The official believes that Letelier's death may have been Condor's first kill. To get more information, the FBI turns to a U.S. State Department expert on Chile. We need to know, and we need to know very frankly. The expert tells them that Chile desperately needs American economic support. The same morning of the assassination, the economics minister of Chile was getting off a plane at Dulles Airport to ask the U.S. government for economic aid to Chile. The expert highly doubts that Chile would endanger its loans by killing Letelier. So it was difficult for me to believe that a government uh, would, on the one hand, order the assassination of this man, while on the other hand, trying to ask the U.S. government for aid. Two weeks after the Letelier assassination, a commercial flight from Barbados to Cuba explodes. All 73 people aboard die. After the explosion, right-wing anti-Castro Cubans proudly claim credit. Because of the timing of the bombing of the airliner, Investigators wonder if anti-Castro Cubans may have also had a hand in the assassination. Letelier was a socialist and an admirer of Fidel Castro. It seems like a long shot, but right now it's the only lead the agency has. Agent Kornick asks the FBI lab to compare the Letelier bomb against past anti-Castro Cuban bombs. Technicians have little to work with because the explosion destroyed most of the evidence. From what little remains, they determined that the bomb is unlike anything they've ever seen before. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack. The lab came back and said basically the Letelier bomb doesn't match other right-wing Cuban bombs that we have examined already. 
Um, we didn't want to hear that. That's the last thing you want to hear, that, it, that you don't have a match. But because of the right-wing Cubans' history of assassinations, investigators can't entirely rule them out. We were trying to keep an open mind that perhaps we have a, a new bomb maker on the set that we're not aware of. Having hit a dead end, investigators set up a tip line to solicit information from around the world. Thousands of leads, literally thousands of leads, came in by telephone. A special 1-800 number was established to handle the leads. We had leads coming in from Europe, leads particularly from Latin America. One lead comes from a New York area reverend who says three Chilean intelligence agents flew out of New York shortly after the assassination. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack interviews the reverend. And it was evident, you know, in the first five minutes of the interview that this guy uh, had seen nothing. So, of course, I'm trying to zero in on, look, you know, who exactly saw these three Chilean agents? The Reverend got the tip from some friends, but he will not reveal their names. I told the Reverend, I said, look, get back to the people that supposedly saw this and uh, get them in touch with us. While he's waiting, Agent Wack heads to New York's JFK airport. He follows up on the Reverend's tip that Chilean agents flew out shortly after the assassination. These items should be noted by the... No one can confirm the story. The case stalls again. There's nothing. A few weeks later, Agent Wack says goodbye to his fiancée, who leaves for her job as an airline flight attendant. He has no idea he is not the only one who watches her go. In the airport parking lot, a threatening stranger confronts Wack's fiance. The bombers are striking back, hitting the FBI close to home. A car bomb in Washington, D.C. kills former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his assistant. As the FBI begins investigating the murder, Special Agent Larry Wack's fiance is threatened. The frightened flight attendant calls Agent Wack. I was absolutely appalled that something like this would happen, that uh, whoever it was uh, didn't have the guts to come after me, that they had to go after her. Agent Wack believes he must have interviewed someone close to the assassination. I don't know what we did, but we struck a nerve somewhere. And now we got to go back and re-examine what we've been doing, and, and, and myself, particularly what I had been doing, who I had been talking to and so on, to see where this threat may have emanated from. Agent Wack's fiancé helps create a sketch of the man who threatened her. Agents show the sketch to Chilean immigrants throughout New York, trying to find someone who recognizes the man. But no one seems to know him. Washington, D.C., one month after the bombing. Clearly said in Townsend versus New York. Assistant U.S. Yeah. Attorney Gene Proper and FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick receive a possible lead. Chilean. The State Department provides photos of two suspicious Chilean intelligence officers whose real names are unknown. A month before the Letelier killing, at the U.S. Embassy in Paraguay, two Chileans requested visas for what were obviously false passports. One of the men did not look Chilean, and the two openly admitted being intelligence agents. They claimed they needed the visas to attend a meeting with the CIA in Washington, D.C. The ambassador decided to take the unusual precaution of secretly photographing the passports. Thank you. When the CIA denied knowing the two agents, the ambassador canceled the visas. Investigators believed the photos could relate to their case. 
FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. We had these two photographs, but we didn't know who they were. If we could identify those two people, we could take the case a step further. The bug shots, we gotta roll through the books. We gotta roll these guys. A few days later, investigators get a lead that again points them to Cuba. A Venezuelan newspaper prints a story claiming right-wing Cubans based in the United States killed Letelier. It names the prime suspects as the Ayala brothers from New Jersey. Investigators know Enrique and Sanchez Ayala well. They are founding members of a violent anti-Castro group called the Cuban Nationalist Movement. They are suspects in several recent high-profile bombings, including a Russian ship in New York five days before the Letelier assassination and an attempted bombing at the New York Academy of Music where Cuban artists were set to perform. The FBI begins to wonder if the Ayala brothers also targeted Chilean socialist Orlando Letelier. In one of New Jersey's Cuban neighborhoods, an FBI agent tracks down Enrique Ayala to find out. When the agent asks him where he was the day Letelier was killed, Ayala gives an odd reply. That's my trump card. It's an ace up my sleeve. Investigators in Washington, D.C. find his comments suspicious. Well, I think Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper. Right away, when you hear something like that, you begin to think, well, what's this guy want to hide? Proper asks the FBI to serve Ayala with a subpoena to appear before the grand jury. In the United States, no citizen is obligated to talk to the police or the FBI. If the FBI comes up to you on the street, you can say, get lost. There is an obligation to testify before the grand jury if you're brought in by subpoena. An agent heads out to serve Enrique Ayala with the subpoena. FBI. Ayala's wife says she doesn't know where he's gone. He's disappeared. Yes. Agents question anti-Castro Cubans, demanding that they give up Ayala. The pressure finally gets to Ayala, who agrees to come in. At Proper's office in Washington, D.C., Ayala proclaims he had nothing to do with Letelier's death. Investigators ask why he made the comment about an ace up his sleeve. Ayala says he was just joking, pulling the agent's chain. Proper grills Ayala before the grand jury. He denies any knowledge of the Letelier murder and takes the fifth when asked if he has recently traveled to Chile. New York City. A few days after Ayala's testimony, Special Agent Wack gets a call at home from a suspected anti-Castro bomber. Do what? He said that uh, I'm coming over to your house in a minute to talk to you. Agent Wack fears he is in danger. The big question was, uh, how did he get my phone number? More importantly, how did he know where I lived? So I grabbed my neighbor, who was a New York City police officer, told him, grab your gun, come outside. And I told him what had happened, that I had gotten this phone call, and I don't know what's coming next. We hid outside in an alleyway, and uh, within a period of about three minutes, here comes this nationalist guy at my front door. Yeah, it's him. He recognized me. We had an altercation out in front of my residence where he was telling us, you know, that uh, they didn't have anything to do with the threat on my fiance, and, you know, why don't you back off of our group? I pretty much told him that uh, the next time you show up at my front door, uh, you're going to go home in a body bag. I was extremely mad at this uh, this whole situation. I mean, it was it was bad enough that my fiance gets threatened, and now I got these bombers showing up at my front, my front door, you know. And you're like, you know, what's next? Far from backing off, Agent Wack cranks up the pressure. 
If the Cubans are nervous, the FBI must be close to finding their connection to the assassination and possibly even the bomber. Agent Wack goes after the Cubans, hunting for anyone with information. If you think you're going to intimidate the FBI into not investigating, you're making a mistake. You're going to make them investigate harder. I don't know nothing about it. The people he approaches give him the cold shoulder or even insult him. They get away from me. But he continues to hunt for leads. Finally, five weeks after Letelier's murder, Agent Wack meets a former Cuban bomb maker who says he wants to talk. It could be a major break in the case. Or it could be a setup for a hit on an FBI agent who's getting too close to the truth. A powerful remote control bomb kills former Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his assistant in Washington, D.C. The FBI believes the key to the case may be hiding in the New York anti-communist Cuban community, an organization known for targeting outspoken socialists. FBI Special Agent Larry Wack doggedly hunts for leads until a former anti-Castro bomb maker tells him he wants to talk. And the thing that he couldn't sleep with was he didn't care that Letelier died. Uh, he couldn't sleep with the fact that the girl was killed, Ronnie Moffat. And that's where he drew the line. The bomb maker says he's heard that Enrique Ayala, the leader of a violent anti-Castro group, has met several times with a Chilean covert contact. He said the Cubans wanted support from the right-wing Chilean government. Agent Wack uses the information to question other informants. They tell him that Ayala has been seen meeting with a tall, blonde Chilean with a military bearing. One informant was telling me that the nationalists were referring to him as El Flaco, or the, the tall, thin one. Agent Wack has now confirmed the link between a Chilean agent and the Cuban nationalist movement. Now you've got evidence of a Chilean agent in contact with a nationalist, and you've got the nationalists with a track record of bombings going back quite a few years. So, you know, it's starting to look like a duck and walk like a duck. The FBI focuses their investigation on Chile, in Santiago. FBI Special Agent Bob Shearer follows up on Agent Wack's discovery of Enrique Ayala's link with Chilean officials. Chile's Interpol representative tells him that Ayala visited Chile two years earlier and may have met with the Chilean government or even the Chilean intelligence service. With this new information, Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper subpoenas Enrique Ayala and two of his friends to appear once more before the grand jury. A few days later, Proper gets a death threat on his private line. What's wrong? Proper believes they must be doing something that's making a guilty party nervous. That means we're doing it right. But instead of backing off, Proper and FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick step up their investigation. We decided we're taking the fifth. They bring in Enrique Ayala who says he and his two friends will take the fifth in front of the grand jury and refuse to answer any questions. Investigators must continue to search for some way to crack open the case and get someone to talk. Gentlemen. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. This thing is dragged on now, nothing happened, but it's not coming to a hit. How the hell do we get on track? A month later in New York, the Secret Service calls in FBI Special Agent Larry Wack. They've arrested a counterfeiter who specializes in making fake IDs who wants to cut a deal. He claims to know of a plot by the Ayala brothers to kill the U.S. Attorney General and Prosecutor Eugene Proper. After months of investigation, this could be the break in the case the FBI has been waiting for the break that will finally lead them to the bombers. 
In Washington, D.C., a remote control bomb kills a former left-wing Chilean ambassador and his assistant. In New York, eight months after the assassination, a counterfeiter contacts the FBI. He provides fake IDs to an anti-communist Cuban group suspected of the bombing. The counterfeiter claims to have inside information and wants to cut a deal with FBI Special Agent Larry Wack. He laid out a, a situation that he was in the process of making up false driver's licenses and passports and whatnot for some of the guys in the nationalist movement. You know, your first assumption is, is this, this crowd's getting ready to take off. They're going underground. The counterfeiter says the Cuban nationalists told him that if their leader, Enrique Ayala, goes to jail, they will kill the U.S. Attorney General and Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper, the prosecutor on the case. Agent Wack offers to speak to the Secret Service on the counterfeiter's behalf if he will inform on Enrique Ayala and his brother Sanchez. And you're willing to follow through on this? The counterfeiter reluctantly agrees. He says he's supposed to meet with Sanchez Ayala soon to deliver a false ID. The night of the meeting, Agent Wack watches from hiding. The counterfeiter arrives carrying a false ID hidden in a magazine. We were able to corroborate a lot of what he was telling us without him knowing it. When they see Ayala exit the restaurant with the same magazine, the FBI knows that their new informant told the truth about working with the Ayalas. Maybe the Ayalas can lead them to their Chilean contact. Proper again calls Enrique Ayala into court, but he fails to appear. FBI agents can't find him anywhere. He's become a fugitive. This only adds to investigate his belief that he played a role in Letelier's assassination. Two and a half weeks later, the investigator's inside man delivers more fake IDs to Sanchez Ayala. At the end of the meeting, Sanchez rips a dollar in two and gives the counterfeiter half. Sanchez says that a tall, blonde Chilean may contact the counterfeiter with the other half of the bill. You know, this was turning into a James Bond uh, spy novel here with a half a dollar bills and everything, the way this thing was going. But there was that tall, blonde Chilean again that we already heard about surfacing. He was this continuous, elusive guy. The FBI doubts this mysterious Chilean intelligence agent will come all the way to America again to meet with their counterfeiter. Chilean intelligence can fabricate their own high-quality fake IDs. Agents follow Sanchez Ayala to Miami, hoping he will lead them to his fugitive brother. But after days of trailing Sanchez, they lose him. Two weeks later, the FBI gets an unlikely break when a tall, blonde Chilean approaches the counterfeiter. At first, the Chilean casually chats with him about motorcycles. But before he leaves, he says that a friend of Enrique Ayala's will be in touch for more false IDs. When he hears about the tall, blonde Chilean, Agent Wack arranges an urgent meeting with the counterfeiter. Agent Wack shows the counterfeiter a photo layout, including a passport photo of a Chilean intelligence agent who tried to get into the U.S. using the false name Juan Williams. Showed him the pictures, and he goes right to the Williams photo, and he says, this is the guy that I met, absolutely no question about it. Investigators finally have a name to link to the mysterious stranger. They go to Chile to try and learn all they can about the man who calls himself Juan Williams. In Santiago, FBI Special Agent Bob Shearer discovers that no one named Juan Williams works for the government or the armed forces. Washington, D.C. 
It has been one year since the assassination of former left-wing Chilean ambassador Orlando Letelier and his assistant Ronnie Moffat. Investigators believe the right-wing anti-Castro Cubans working with people inside Chile's intelligence agency possibly orchestrated the murder. Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper tries to make sense of the lead so far. The case started to slow down in, the, in mid to late 1977 because when we had this information, we didn't really have a whole lot of proof. And we were trying to get information from Chile without a lot of success. Investigators decide to approach the Chilean government directly and demand information on the intelligence agent who is meeting with Cuban bomb makers in the U.S. and uses the false name Juan Williams. Chile's got what appears to be a bona fide intelligence agent running around with a bunch of bombers in the United States, and this is going to be very embarrassing for Chile. They better have a good answer for this one. In Santiago, Chile, what is it that I can do for you today? Agent Shearer tells a Chilean official that the FBI wants to interview Juan Williams and another intelligence agent who also applied for a U.S. visa using a false name. You're quite sure. We have some photos of them. The U.S. could prosecute both men for filing for a visa with a fake passport. The Chileans say they will look into it. We have a very large organization. After waiting a month with no reply from Chile, Proper files court papers with an unsealed cover letter that includes the agent's false names and implies they played a major role in Letelier's murder. If the Chilean government masterminded the killing, Proper intends to hold them accountable. I summarized what I thought the evidence would show and put it in a letter that was outside the package. Nobody had ever seen that done before, and the State Department sort of laughed about it. But I thought when, when that became public, and I made sure it became public because it was not a sealed document, the Chileans would panic and we'd start to hear things. Then what happened is the photographs which were in their seal leaked to the press. News stories hit front pages all over the world, accusing the Chilean intelligence service called Dina of the killing. And the Chileans went crazy because all of a sudden it was saying Dina was involved with the Cubans in killing Letelier. Didn't say 100%. And the Chileans started calling us. They wanted a meeting with the Secretary of State. They wanted a meeting with the Attorney General. The newspaper articles unleash a flood of tips for the FBI. One newspaper identifies the mysterious blonde intelligence agent known as Juan Williams. In a shocking twist, it reveals that he was born in the US. The FBI is stunned. Could it be possible that the Chilean assassin is an American? While the FBI investigates the 1976 car bomb killing of Orlando Letelier and his aide Ronnie Moffat, newspapers all over the world pick up the story of two Chilean intelligence officers suspected of the killings. When the story breaks, the FBI gets word that a newspaper has identified the intelligence agent known as Juan Williams. It appears he's an American. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. When it turned out one of them was a U.S. national, that made our position so much stronger. And why was a U.S. national working for the Chilean intelligence service? The U.S. passport office reports that there is a Michael Townley who matches the description of the blonde intelligence agent currently registered as an American living in Chile. He's 36, born in Iowa, but grew up in Chile. Agents head to Fort Lauderdale to follow up another tip that Juan Williams is really a man named Kenneth Einart. He's been buying electronic surveillance equipment for the Chilean government at an electronics store that sells hidden microphones, phone taps, and other high-tech surveillance equipment. The store owner identifies the Juan Williams passport photo as Kenneth Einart. The owner provides records showing that Einart shopped at the store the day the bomb killed Letelier. He also provides an official letter from the Chilean government 
authorizing Kenneth Einard and Michael Townley to make purchases on their behalf. The FBI now believes that Kenneth Einhardt is an alias for Michael Townley and that the Chilean government is somehow involved in the killing. Now, the FBI has their first solid suspect in the case. The next day in New York, FBI Special Agent Larry Wack meets with a counterfeiter turned informant. He's been watching a group of anti-communist Cuban nationalists the FBI suspects of working with the government of Chile. Agent Wack wants to know how they are responding to the news that the FBI has identified their Chilean contact, Michael Townley. Everybody in the exile community with the nationalists and everywhere else went scrambling. It was like, uh-oh, cat's out of the bag. They know who he is. And it was time to run. Agent Wack pressures the counterfeiter to set up a meeting with a key Cuban nationalist suspect before he runs. I told the, uh, the counterfeiter, I said, just tell him flat out that I came to see you. I found out that you're hanging with the nationalists again and that I paid you a visit and you're getting subpoenaed to the grand jury. The plan works and the counterfeiter meets with the suspect to ask his advice. They ask you to testify. The suspect tells him to take the fifth and say nothing. The counterfeiter keeps asking why. Because we did it. We did it, meaning Letelier. We did it. We know it. They know it. Let them prove it. Uh, which is exactly what we wanted. The FBI now has an informant's claim that a nationalist confessed. But they still need some physical evidence linking the Cubans with Michael Townley. We couldn't connect him to the murder. We had no evidence he was involved in the murder, but we certainly believed it because he was the blonde Chilean who was dealing with the Cuban nationalist movement that internally had said they're involved in the Letelier murder, and they were now fleeing. They were running from us. Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper and FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick try to fit together the evidence. You know, it's one thing to have a source who you may or may not trust 100% tell you one thing. It's another thing to have, you know, actual proof. Investigators desperately need someone to cooperate and confess to what happened. They hope it will be Michael Townley, but the agents have to find him first. The next step was to go to Chile and to try to in some way force the government of Chile to cooperate with us in the investigation. The fact that these two men had applied for false passports to come to the United States a week before the assassination was of real interest to us. Over the next two weeks, proper in the US government put tremendous pressure on Chile Proper prepares official letters through the world court, requesting the chance to talk with Townley. I took him to the chief judge in Washington, and he signed the documents. He asked me how the case was going. I'll, I'll never forget this. He said, how's the case going? I said, it's a very tough case, judge. It's just very tough. He said, I know that. He said, but God makes people who do things like this make mistakes. All you've got to do is find the mistakes. To find the mistakes, Proper has to get to Townley. But the prosecutor is still getting resistance from the Chilean government. I'm sorry. And the Chilean government said, you know, this is going to make the government fall. We can't give over an intelligence officer. We said he's an American. He committed a crime in the United States. We want him. We were not allowed access to people that we wanted to have access to, members of the Chilean intelligence service. But at the same time, uh, other Chilean officials were cooperating with us quietly. Behind the scenes, the Pinochet government quietly cuts a deal with the US. They will hand over Townley if the US promises not to use his testimony against Chile. The US agrees. 
The next day, Chilean police take Michael Townley for a drive. He hopes that the intelligence service will protect him, perhaps even reward him with a long vacation in a remote area. Just take me far and get out of here. Huh? He has no idea what is really waiting for him. On vacation, huh? Chilean intelligence agent and bombing suspect Michael Townley thinks he's about to embark on a vacation. But FBI agents are waiting at the airport for authorities to turn him over. FBI Special Agent Carter Cornick. There was an Air Ecuadoriano flight going from Chile to New York. And the plane was held by the Chilean government on the runway until we got there. Townley was turned over to us. He was disoriented. He was afraid. He could not believe that the Chilean government had betrayed him. On the flight, Townley refuses to talk without a lawyer. Once in the US, the FBI holds Townley at the Marine base in Quantico, Virginia. They suspect him of murdering a Chilean diplomat and enlisting right-wing Cubans to help him. But the only real charge they have against him is using a fake passport. Townley meets with his attorney, while Assistant U.S. Attorney Gene Proper prepares for plea negotiations. And it's going to be very difficult, because we really don't have a murder case against Townley. We still did not have any case against Michael Townley except the passport violation case. Miami, Florida. Hey, man, hold up. That's a yellow. Agents get a break when an alert Miami police officer spots one of the men linked to Townley in the murder, Cuban nationalist leader Enrique Ayala. You're Enrique Ayala, aren't you? No, sir. Please take off your sunglasses. This is my identification, sir. Say, what do you see? Agent Cornick and prosecutor proper use Ayala's arrest and the arrests of other nationalist suspects to pressure Townley. Enrique Ayala has been arrested. We went to Tanley and his lawyer and said, your time's about out. We've just rolled the Cubans up. We're going to make the deal with the first person who's willing to talk to us. We knew the Cubans would never talk, but we didn't tell that to Tanley and his lawyers. Tanley has to think we know what happened. We singled him out and brought him to the United States. He has to worry that we have more information than he knows about. But all we had on Michael Tanley was a passport violation and knowledge that he had met with the Cubans. But unless the Cubans talked or Townley talked, we didn't have enough to bring a case against anybody. Don't worry, Michael. After hours of negotiation, Townley agrees to cooperate in exchange for a 10-year sentence. Townley reveals that he worked as a highly skilled agent and assassin for Chilean intelligence. He worked for the Chilean secret police, which was run by a general. And he viewed his assassinations as legitimate orders from his government. The Chilean secret police wanted Letelier dead because Letelier was viewed as a spokesman who was in the United States and creating a fuss against the Pinochet government. He was meeting on Congress with senators, he was talking around the world, and the Pinochet government was a very repressive right-wing government, and Letelier was very well-spoken and he was causing them some grief. This was not Townley's first assassination. As an expert in electronics and bomb making, Townley helped commit assassinations in South America, North America, and Europe. This man, without question, was the most dangerous man I have ever met. This is a man who bragged about his role in building bombs that killed other people. And the justification? Letelier was a soldier, I was a soldier. Townley says he made a bomb in a motel room and attached it to Letelier's car at night. The Cubans were anxious to create ties to the right-wing Chilean government and agreed to help. Townley arranged for the Cubans to set the bomb off. He then flew to Florida 
leaving two of the Cubans with a remote control. He says he doesn't know who pushed the button. The Cubans had no interest in Mr. Letelier. They wanted a relationship with the Chilean secret police for several reasons. Um, Chile could give them sanctuary when they were in trouble in the United States. Uh, they had a very similar political ideology, was very right-wing. Um, and they could get, they thought, material support, maybe money, from Dina. To prove Townley's story to a jury, the FBI buys an identical car and has him build an exact copy of the bomb. All of this was filmed by the FBI so that it could be used at trial actually to placing the bomb up underneath the car. All of the components were identical, the car was identical, and the question would, was, would the results be identical? We didn't know. Stand by for detonation. Three, two, one. When the dust cleared, I looked at the car that had just been blown up. It was the same car that I had seen two years ago in the crime scene. I could not believe it. I turned to look at Mike Townley. Mike Townley's face was ashen. He turned to me and said, I'd like to leave. I had two of the other agents take him back to the car. Townley was somebody who had been involved in several murders, but never close up. He, was, he always did it at a distance. He never saw the victim. He was a soldier. He was told to assassinate somebody. He put a bomb somewhere. He did something, but he didn't do it close up. And when he saw the effects of it, he was apparently very affected by it. Two and a half years after the Letelier assassination, the Ayala brothers and an associate go on trial. The photos of the two blown up cars provide the crowning piece of evidence. The resemblance was remarkable. At the end of seven weeks of trial, the jury, when it deliberated, asked for two pieces of evidence. One were the pictures of the cars. An hour later, they came back guilty on all counts. The court sentences Enrique and Sanchez Ayala in the murder plot. But in a retrial, their convictions are overturned on a technicality. Over the next 20 years, two other anti-Castro nationalists and three Chilean officials end up serving time for the Letelier killing. FBI agent Carter Cornick sees Letelier's murder as a tragic misunderstanding. I think he was assassinated for two reasons. One, for what he had done which was stopping government Dutch loans to Chile. And two, they perceived him as a threat, which in reality he was not. If the Chilean military believed that Letelier was forming a government in exile in the United States, it was simply not valid. It's just paranoia. Documents uncovered after the fall of Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet would later confirm that the Chilean government ordered the death of Letelier. The FBI's relentless pursuit of the killers solved a difficult case and put rogue nations on notice. I think it sent a message to other governments considering extraterritorial sanctions, assassinations. Think twice before you do it. <laughs>